Hello, Blunders, and welcome, welcome to, oh, wow, episode number 190. Nice wow. round number of Real Blend. Coming up on 200, boys, 200. A podcast that would like to offer The Rock an open invitation to fulfill his destiny. And join <laughs> us here on Real Blend. Um, <laughs> All right, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Why that's did good. you not right, think yeah. that joke was going to land? I don't get it. What's, I don't understand the joke. You didn't Gabe what wrote happened? that joke. No. Gabe wrote that oh, joke. Oh, Vin Diesel went on Instagram the other day. Oh, that's day. what that is. I took a <laughs> screenshot and sent it to no. you. Yeah. Okay, no, I, I know that story, but I forgot that he said, I, I didn't know the exact wording of the way that he. Yeah, he said. What did he call him? Nephew or something like that? My little my little brother. My little brother. But the best then, part was the, the picture in which they're looking at each other eye to eye. Yeah, which yeah, those yeah. two guys, we've all, we've all met those guys. Vin Diesel ain't looking the rock eye to eye. No. Vin Diesel was like soapbox. expanded. He was expanded somehow. Yes, like, he was I was going to say, did you, did you see Eric Eisenberg's <laughs> yes. sleuth there? Yeah. No. He put up an image with the actual sh- screenshot and you could see that Vin Diesel had clearly been enhanced from the original <laughs> image. He just made himself look bigger. <laughs> but like Sean, in the post, he says like, you need to fulfill your destiny and come back like, and finish the... <laughs> <laughs> Which is that like, isn't that a Darth Vader line? <laughs> Probably, yeah. Sounds I like can't it. believe that Terrific. that was real. <laughs> I, I would have, I would have paid a thousand dollars to be in the room when someone showed that to Dwayne Johnson for the first time. <laughs> I'm surprised he hasn't commented. He hasn't said anything that, back. That's the best part. Yeah. I hope he doesn't say anything. There's yeah. Nothing. That, he doesn't There's have nothing. to say anything. Oh, that's like, funny. Oh, gosh. All right. This week's show, uh, we're going to pick our very favorite Hans Zimmer scores. Uh, at Belfast is coming to theaters. And to coincide with that, we have director Kenneth Branagh as a guest on this show. Uh, let me throw it to the guys, starting with Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Kev, how are you, sir? Sean, Jake, Gabe, um, we're doing a podcast that has Sir Kenneth Branagh on the show this week. So yes, returning guest, guest, by the way, as, returning guest. I mean, I, I, it's, I, I know we've been doing the show for 190 episodes, but like, it's, it's still pretty <laughs> wild. The guests that we not we've counting had. the bonus episodes with Hans Zimmer. Yes. Yeah, there's a bonus episode right now with Hans Zimmer uh, that is available. Um, and if you if you're a nerd at all about his music and we cover his whole career, um, just go to the anywhere you get your podcast, iTunes, and it also has a video component on YouTube. So. Yeah, go to YouTube and, and search us, yeah. please. I, I would argue that if you're a fan of a popular film in the last two decades, <laughs> he ta- he touches yeah. on something that you'll enjoy. Absolutely. You watched <laughs> The Lion King when you were six. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, the other host, of course, is Jake Hamilton, Fox 32 in Chicago. Hi, Jakey. I love your shirt. Oh, thank you. It's new. Ooh. New shirt. And I wore it. It has a shamrock. And I did that for Belfast because we spoke uh, to Kenneth Branagh. I have a question. Did you buy it or yes. did Michelle buy it? No, I bought it. We were out shopping uh, last night together. And I picked up two that look like this. Um, do you also wear Lucky Brand jeans or just the shirts? I do wear Lucky Brand. Actually, Lucky Brand is one of my favorite brands. Thank you very much. Oh. Not not uh, a sponsor of the show. No, but not I wish sponsored. That, I wish that they would be, though. Because uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't wear a lot of different clothes. Um, and we could Lucky call, Brand we could is call one it of them. L- Lucky Blend. We could do that with a little, re- little reads about that. We'll just completely <laughs> sell out. <laughs> this, thing, <laughs> <laughs> this thing writes itself. So if you ever uh, go to Press Play, on a four-hour episode of Real Blend, you know that we've really yeah. sold out. Welcome guys. to the Toyota podcast. <laughs> <laughs> where we talk about movies. It's, been, uh, it's like it's like when Jurassic World, where they like it like aren't all the dinosaurs like Pepsi dinosaur this dinosaur? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this uh, week brought to you by Purell. Producer yeah. Gabe Kovach uh, joining us as well too. Hello, Gabe, Gabe Doritos you? Kovac. <laughs> uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, hello, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Head down. Give us a like and a subscribe and meet us here every single week and go look for that uh, Hans Zimmer one, which has a terrific visual element to it. Uh, if you still need to sign up for Real Blend Premium, which allows you to get an ad free version of the show, uh, an extra segment every single week on Mondays and a newsletter from me, check the description uh, right now for more information on how you can get that. So we wanted to ask, when was the last time that you snuck into a movie theater? There was no real uh reason behind this gabe and i were just like let's not do something topical this week let's just do something bigger picture um and and one of the things about sneaking into a movie theater gabe uh, jake i'm gonna throw this to you because i want to give my comment about it as well too uh i said when is the last time that you snuck into a movie theater i gave you three choices one was when i was a kid or a teenager uh two was um i do it all the time 
and three was never that stealing. So where do you think the people went? I think people probably did it as a teenager, and mm. I don't think people probably ever do it, probably do it as much these days. 57% said, no, that's stealing. They don't do it. Huh. And some ne of the comments... Okay. Never, never... That's what wait, they say. Wait, okay, wait, 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 let's define how we're talking sneaking, because I, like, ticket whenever to I movie. think, yeah, I think of, like, as a teenager, buying a ticket to an R-rated film, or I'm sorry, to a yeah, PG-13 right. film, and going into an R-rated film. To me, that's... That's, that's, that's how film. I meant it to be. Well, yeah. no, well, hang that's on, a lot of people also, also another... Uh, not that I'm giving strategies, but another way, that's one way to get a, past the rating. Mm -hmm. But, and I think people were commenting this as well, and as teenagers, I think a lot of thing, a thing a lot of people do is you buy a ticket to one movie, yeah. but you see like two or three. Yeah, that's what that's, I was doing. Oh, oh my God, I don't have time. Part. Who has time for that? Well, well back in the day, I, you a, did. A 14-year-old kid, yeah, yeah. That, they have all the time in the world. I, I think I remember the last movie that I like, actively snuck into because of my age and it was i was working at amc um and they knew i was 16 or whatever it was and they were very diligent about not letting me go into r-rated movies even though i was an employee they, they were like mean about it a little bit um That's and so i remember weird. i remember like my buddy worked at the box office and he sold me a ticket to shadow of the vampire <laughs> uh, not, uh, with uh defoe Such a great movie and i go in to uh, to the theater and one of my bosses sees me and i get written up for it so what, were you seeing? Having, what were you gonna I, go see i was trying to see shadow of the vampire oh that's the r movie and, and he sold me the ticket to it okay gotcha. uh, as a friend so we both got written up because he sold me the ticket and then i got written up for trying to go in so i would have to what i would do is like i would have like a 6 to 11 shift uh i'd work in the box office at amc so there's a there was a regal I was like 10 minutes from my house. And what I would do is I would go in and this is, this was just like, I, I, this is how I did it for Requiem. And the last one I did it for, I think was snatch um, because I couldn't watch either of them at AMC. Um, so I would go up to the box office and I would say, Hey, I'd like a ticket to snatch. By the way, I go to this college down the street. I forgot my college ID. <laughs> Could I get, can I get my student discount still? And so oh, that, well done. All, what what that basically does is tell them, OK, he must be over 17. Yep. And they would always sell. If you look, if you look yeah, at my they'll tell you, ticket, no, they'll say, no, nah, sorry, I can't do it. But they won't ask you for your ID. They'll just right. say, no, nah, sorry. Wow. Right. wow. That's like, that is my, brilliant. My Requiem for a Dream ticket and my Snatch ticket both say student. We're on bought them. illegally. <laughs> oh, that's really uh, funny. Uh, but I, I, paid, don't, I paid for them. Did you come, did you come up with that on your own? Yeah, because I, I was so I wanted to see Requiem and Snatch so bad, and oh, like Requiem the, on the, the big old, screen. The, I didn't see Requiem the old, on the big screen. The old days, it was more As a like kid, you shouldn't have gone to that. Well, the old the old days, I would you I would do like um I would buy a ticket to I don't know I'm I'm, I'm, I'm this is not a real example but Transformers and I would walk into South Park. You know what I mean? So sure, like, or, sure. or, or or I would buy a ticket to right. uh this movie and I'd walk into American Psycho. Um, but. It was like that was my like at, at, when I actually wanted to keep those tickets. I wanted which, my Requiem ticket. I wanted which my to me ticket. to me buying like as a kid buying a ticket and walking into the wrong movie is like <laughs> it's like a piece of Americana. Sure. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. That, yeah. Just so yeah. Right, yeah. You and know? it's so exhilarating. Like like dude, I remember sneaking into South Park and like I felt like I was like, I felt like I was top of the world. I'm like, I am in here and I am watching this and they're Dude. farting and it's hilarious. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm waiting and I'm like looking down and I'm like, oh God, there's an usher. Oh, he's going to see me. Yeah. It was almost, it was like, it was like, it was part of the whole thing. It was the best part of the experience. My, one of my best friends in high school at the time, he and I were, were freshmen uh, in high school and we wanted to go see Identity. Now my concern was, and this is how my brain was yeah. working. And Kevin, I feel like you would think the same way. It's opening weekend. It's going to be popular. It's probably going to sell out. So we have to have tickets to right. identity because if we have tickets for something else and we take a, and then there are two people who all of a sudden can't get a seat, they're going to start going, okay, two people don't belong here. So hmm. I had my mom walk up and buy tickets and then bring them over to us. So we get yep. in, they let us through and, and they get us to stand in line. And this, this usher who probably was like two years older than us, starts <laughs> walking up and down the line, looking at everybody. And he stops at us and he goes, uh, what, what, what grade are you guys in? And my friend automatically goes, we're freshmen. And I elbowed him like this. He goes, in college. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy just, they just kept, he probably, he had to have known we were full of shit, but he just like, just kept walking. I don't my know buddy's dad bought us tickets to scream. He bought three tickets to scream. 
my ticket, my buddy Ben's ticket, and he bought his own ticket, walked us into the theater, and then left. Oh. <laughs> That's how we got into Scream. See, <laughs> you guys did it for R-rated movies. My thing was, the only R-rated movie that my parents bought me a ticket to was the first Die Hard, because I was in eighth grade and I was dying to go see wow. the first Die Hard. But in Sunrise Mall in Massapequa Park, Long Island, where I grew up, there was a multiplex that was inside the mall, and the ticket booth was away from the theater. It was like um, down the hallway a little while inside the mall. You had to buy your ticket and then walk back to the oh. multiplex. And there was a gate, uh, like a, a roped off velvet rope at the, at the front of it. And, yeah. and the person, the usher there tore your ticket. And then once you were in, there were nine multiplexes to choose from. So every Saturday morning, I would go in with the one ticket and then it was Disneyland. Like I went yeah. to almost everything that was there. It didn't matter that it, I just didn't want to pay. It didn't matter the, the, the rating, but I would pay one price and then go see eight or nine different things. God, or no, I just a, a quarter of a movie. Yeah. I did five yeah. in one day. Yeah, a quarter of a movie. I did five <laughs> in one day. I will say in the midst of a pandemic, we do not advocate for only paying for one <laughs> ticket. Please support the theater system. Yes. <laughs> but here's the thing. What I was going to say is what makes it so hard nowadays is reserved seating. Like you can't just yeah. go into oh, a theater. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. What, which, which is why I feel like a majority of people's answers should be teenager i feel like yeah uh, i feel it's like hard more, to do this i feel like people are uh, kind of up on their although a if i were a kid now at least at well yeah i think in most theaters they have the seating chart outside yeah. the theater now mm. and you can see which ones are available oh, or not you know what i've noticed because i've been able to go back to the amcs recently for press screenings is when you are going down the hallway they don't put on the monitor what movie is playing in that auditorium oh interesting yeah oh Mm -hmm. so you don't uh -huh. know they, but they do well the, the whatever what the amc by me still does do they, they really yeah. okay yeah they're listed on mine they're listed in like yeah. digital now they yeah, yeah. for sure it'd be pretty it'd smart mean, for them obviously... not to do that though it'd be pretty yeah. smart yeah, for them true. to just keep it secret because then you don't know what you're gonna sneak into so i this love these stories back. this is a fun time this yeah, is yeah, a fun one this could have been a premium episode eh, maybe it will yeah, be we blow right now gabe's going son of a bitch all right enough of us let's throw to uh sir kenneth brana the guest uh, on this week's show, director of Belfast, returning Which we guest. also did not pay to see. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell Which him Which also that. features characters going to movies. It's a perfect, perfect uh, oh, segue. Perfect it is segue. a good segue. Yes. So without further ado, Kenneth Brana on the Real Blend Podcast. All three of us are absolutely in love with your film. It is such a beautiful, beautiful film. We can't wait to discuss it with you. We wrote a ton of questions, so we want to dive right in. Um, Thank you. The, the Irish have an extremely uh, lyrical cadence uh, to their dialogue. Normal conversations uh, flow like stories. My name is Sean O'Connell. I come from a long line of them. So it was very comforting to hear the way that they all talked. Um, and it's very prevalent in your film. So I'm curious if that was uh, in your script uh, in your edit, or uh, found on the day of shooting, or all of the above, the way that your cast dialed into that? Uh, it's a very interesting uh, way of thinking about it. Yeah, cadence is a cadence is a great way of talking about some of the kind of um, qualities, for instance, say Kieran Hines has. You know, he's uh, it's as if um, with with uh, words and sentences to other people, he kind of caresses the idea. Um, it sort of uh, flo floats it across, if you like, you know, just sort of mm. drops it. It's like a loop. <laughs> Way back, I saw a Sean O'Casey play called uh, Juno and the Paycock. And there's a scene in that where uh, a character is trying to woo Minnie Owens or Minnie Owens, Minnie Owens, oh, he <laughs> loves you. And, you know, they're talking about Minnie, Minnie, look, you know, we can go here and we go, we can go there and it'll all be so cozy. <laughs> and I remember thinking that phrase, so cozy, was so typically Irish. And there's, um, there's in the scene with Pop, Kieran Hines and the kid where he's sort of encouraging him to cheat at maths. Um, he, he, it's, it, it, Kieran Hines sort of plays his voice without um, self-consciousness, like a sort of... Um, little lyrical flute or something. And mm. they've all got that. Katrina's got it from County Monaghan, her version of it. And of course, Judy's got Lifetime of Shakespeare plus Dublin in her veins. And then, and then uh, Jude and Jamie have their sort of Belfast inflected version of it. But yeah, I would say you're talking about an, an innate musicality that I was writing from how I heard it and that they supplied liberal doses of extra for as well it's a great gift to the film that irish musicality and it, it comes from the dna of the of the individuals 
It's incredible. Um, you know, Kenneth, uh, one of the things I told you yesterday, is this is one of the most beautifully photographed and shot films I've ever seen in my life. Harris's cinematography is just incredible. And I wanted to talk to you about the lens choices, the cameras, uh, the specific black and white that you're using. Um, there was one particular shot that I that blew my mind. I don't know why. It's when Jamie's telling this joke uh, and you have in the top left and right of the corner, you have partial faces like you're almost in the crowd trying to hear the joke with them. So can you just talk about your lenses and your shots and your cameras. And I, I just thought that all that was so beautiful. Well, we kept feeling as though we wanted to use all of the, um, all of the framings that were available in windows and through doors with vertical and horizontal sectioning of, of, uh, of people. There's a shot that I like where dad talks to the boys about Australia and, um, and uh, we're looking through a window. We see one. We see Mum beyond. Then she comes up. We pull out. Then we put a door frame between two new frames, which have Buddy, and then in the far background Will, and on the left hand side Pa and Ma. And it's as if somehow it, it, it just gives the idea ex expressed visually of uh, of parallel lives. We were shooting uh, on an Arri digital camera, but we were using the um, uh, anamorphic lenses that we used on Hamlet, which were originally used on Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> so, the, the, so there is this kind no of pressure. There is this kind of big, big connection back to uh, it really a sort of fusion of a kind of intimate chamber piece, large format via the lenses, digital, digital ex experience, which through the 185 framing, so we didn't oh. go for the widescreen framing, uh, contributed to a sort of a depth in terms of these uh, lenses, a depth of detail, um, but that nevertheless was sort of compressed in terms of the width of the image. But there was to do with Harris's instinct about wanting it to be as rich as possible. So mm. he's always, Harris is a great um, sort of film aficionado. He trained both in England and at the AFI. He was uh, Conrad Hall's assistant for many oh, years. Oh. Wow. He carried, oh. he ca he carried wow. batteries on our film. For, he was the camera camera assistant carrying batteries on our film of Frankenstein back in 94. So he, oh. so he's, a, he's a, an absolute film nerd and a, a tech nerd, always does so many tests beforehand. And he carries the lenses around. You would, in this case, given where these lenses have come from, he carries them around like... Um, you know, like they're precious objects, like it's the, uh, the from 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 the Holy Grail or something. So we're we're always we're never casual about how we want to capture the pictures. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. Wow, um, Kenneth, I, I know um, Dame Judi Dench. Her her eyesight is not what it used to be, and I had read somewhere because of that you actually had to physically bring over the script to her home, sit down with her, and actually read the script to her. And that seems like an incredibly sweet intimate moment. I was just wondering if you don't mind if you could just tell me what that moment was like because in particular because of this film in general which is a sweet intimate film if you could just describe what it's like to read your script to Jane Duty Dench. Well I, I'd never done this kind of thing before. Apparently it was it was the kind of thing famous playwrights like George Bernard Shaw or Noel Coward when they engaged their actors for the first time they would read the play and they would read all of the parts. This was and that's how they'd read it to producers. Um, I had never experienced it on either side of that, but because Judy's eyesight is as it is, and she she sort of re required this, um, and so um, I, I went down. There was a Monday morning. Um, she's a she's always on time, so she was ready for me. I'm always on time, so I was early as well. So we were able to kick off bang on 10 a.m. Like the she has a little grandfather clock. Ding. <laughs> we, got the, we got to the 10th stroke of 10. I had been given my cup of tea and my lemon biscuit, uh, which she had uh, baked. And at, at, at the 10th stroke of 10, I began reading. And I hadn't realized how, how as, as time went on, two, two things were at play. First of all, you realize, oh, my God, I'm reading for a long time to Judy Dench. She's directed me. She's a great actress, great artist. <laughs> Uh, that's a lot of scrutiny. I felt like I was at a really big audition. Um, and then and then about halfway through the film, I realized I, I began to realize the cumulative effect of the emotional power of the story. I had by that stage, having finished the writing of it, I was in the process of putting it together. So it had become a bit more mechanical. I was a bit detached from, as it were, the soul of it. That reading in the quiet of that spring 
Monday morning in Judy's house in the country, just her and me in this little sitting room. And about halfway through, I found I couldn't speak anymore. I was just, it just, I can't remember what the scene was, but it just got me and I couldn't, mm. I couldn't continue. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll just keep breathing, keep breathing. And it was just, I don't know how long the pause was. Judy didn't say a thing, didn't do a thing, didn't move and never mentioned it afterwards. Wow. But it was a really thick moment of understanding between the pair of us. So I carried on. Uh, and, it, and in the end, she, she was, you know, she was she was very, very complimentary about the writing. But we, di we didn't say that much. But what we knew was that we'd been involved in a kind of a happening, like a sort mm. of an incantation, like the story had been brewed up. And um, immediately she started to talk about Irish relatives of her that this character reminded her of. And um, and so it was uh, it was very unusual, very memorable and one of those sort of unspoken bonding moments that was um, a memorable part of this experience. That is beautiful. Um, there's a riot scene early in your film uh, in the beginning of the movie that to me uh, shows how quickly life can go from from fighting imaginary dragons to to using a trash can lid to fend off actual stones that are being tossed. But from a director's standpoint, I was hoping you can elaborate on the difficulties um, of staging a riot practically, because I know that because of the physical destruction that has to happen, you don't get very many shots at it. No, exactly right. And uh, so we had the curious byproducts of COVID because we were going to put all those people together. We were lucky enough to find the research that said in such uh, instances, and certainly the case in my experience, that people put, you know, put ha handkerchiefs over their, over their mouths. So in terms of masking our rioters who are in a crowd mm. COVID super spreading moment, we were able to cope with that. It's a kind of series of um, mechanical preparation. So we, uh, Jimmy O'Donnell, Jimmy O'D, as he's called, been our stunt guy for many movies now. He's a, he's a terrific fella. He's very disciplined. We had him, we had uh, an army expert, and we had several people who for a few days drilled our crowd. So we talked about where they got to, where they would move. Everything was sort of choreographed in, but never, never, never at warp speed. Uh, then we talked about how we'd shoot and the decision to believe that maybe young Jude could sustain the concentration of being at the center of the shot through the whole um, of the opening where every that, other piece of action would happen. That 360 so that became, shot is gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, and we yeah. thank you. And we, we decided to do that on a piece of circular track. It wasn't mm. a, a steady cam. Uh, it kept us very precise. It meant we could be very sharp focus wise on him. Uh, and, uh, but, but of course, we, we, we planned where they would go to. We planned where the crowd behind the kid would go to. But then once we said, right, here's one of our two takes, we had to go for it. And really the biggest question mark for me was, how was Jude going to handle it? Because there's no question he was frightened. Yeah. You know, he was, it was, you know, he hadn't been in that situation before. And also he's a very bright young fellow. So he knew that the shot rested on him. You know, we could have all those other million variables, break every window, risk the, um, you know, the physical contact with everybody, which would have some bruises and batterings and stuff, but we couldn't do it endlessly. And if he coughed, stopped, you know, said, oh, I've missed my mark or anything, it was over. So it was a very, very, uh, once we had rehearsed, everything that could possibly rehearse, didn't break anything and then said, now it's time to go for it. Almost the biggest, um, you know, finger cross was about, were we going to traumatize this kid or was he going to, going to live through it? And, uh, and was we had to tell him, I promise you, Katrina Balfe will arrive. Super Ma will be there. You will be picked up. You won't be left in the middle of this riot. But when you do those shots, you know, it's, it's a, that's a big deep breath for everybody on the set. But it, it, it worked with gangbusters. Oh, it sure did. You know, Kenneth, one of the things this movie does beautifully is it celebrates the escapism of movies and, and being able to go to the films. And uh, obviously the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang scene uh, as the characters are leaning into the screen is incredible. And I thought to myself, like, that's happened to me a few times in movies that I've watched that you've been in specifically. Like, I remember seeing Dunkirk on 143 70 millimeter IMAX and leaning into those shots. And then Tenet, I saw 190 because they didn't have the 1431 open here, uh, unfortunately. So I wanted to ask 
ask you in terms of immersion, like th that immersion and that leaning forward, uh, you were already a master filmmaker prior to working with Nolan as an actor, but I wondered what Nolan taught you in terms of, if anything, in terms of immersion that you kind of pulled forward into your directing uh, now. For him, for me, it was always with him. He, he arrives on set with a level of preparation, which is quite astonishing. And then, although he's super um, scrupulous and rigorous, he does this amazing thing that makes me nervous, which is um, when the five battleships, the 10 planes, the 2,000 men are in the air or around the, in this case, the mole on which we were working that long pier, and I see a producer's part of my mind is going, oh, my God, this is all like it's burning cash. And they're all there's a tide going in and out. There are, you know, um, there are air rules to manage. And he slows down and talks very quietly and simply to me and James Darcy and is insistent that really the, the absolutely critical part and all of that stuff, just like the 360 we were talking about, is going to be in the shot that we're doing. All of that is going to be in my close up and James Darcy's close up. But he kind of keeps that all cooking and then makes sure that somehow the intimate, the intimate part of this is, is correct. And he'll, it's, it, it, he's almost leisurely as he does this. And I think what it does is he, he makes you sort of ratchet down into understanding that don't worry about any of that, you know, only worry about this bit of human contact. And I've often thought that like... Um, like a great footballer, he slows time down. It's such a Nolan thing to do. But he, some, it's as if all of those bits of hardware, which are, you know, I mean, it's a million walkie-talkies coordinating real things, mm -hmm. um, are, are in abeyance while he gets the performance right at the center of it. So it, to literally connect to what we're just saying to Sean, though, the, the, um, what was at the center of it, Jude, in our 360 riot shot, and us, in you know discussions about you know how we were going to get four hundred thousand men on the beach, had at least equal, but probably more importance for the character and dialogue work at the centre of it than the massive amount of physical production that was going on in the same mm. shot. So, I see calm is what I learned from him. Amazing! Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Cool, thank you, Kenneth. I, I after seeing this film, I feel like I know you so much more. I feel like I know your family. Whenever <laughs> the film was over, though, I just can't, couldn't help but think like there are so many members of his family. Uh, I'm assuming maybe who are no longer with us that I wish could have seen this. Who in your family is no longer with us? That do you most wish you could have shown this film to? Well, inevitably, you know, my parents. For uh, um, they, I, I don't know whether I could have coped, frankly, with with uh, showing them the script or, I mean, uh, I don't know my, my father, I don't know what my father would have said. I mean, he did have an issue with back tax. There, there was, you know, it mm. was the, it was, as he said, the building train in Ireland, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you're probably aware, sometimes with construction, there are some creative ways that you work with the Inland Revenue Service and and uh, and he did. So he wouldn't have been thrilled about the world finding out about that probably. But I think that, um, I think that they would have, that would have been an amazing time. I had one real life experience of it where about it, that gave me a preview of what it might've been like for them to see this film. We, uh, in 1996, after we made our film of Hamlet, I was invited to be part of the Kennedy Center Honors, which that year included Jack Lemmon. And uh, I was oh. part of the tribute there. And as part of what the, your, the government of these great United States of America do in that instance is they invite both people who are part of the tribute and their families. So sure. I took my mum and dad to the White House. And, um, and now that you've seen the film, you'll know what this means when... The three of us were walking into. It makes me choke as I'm talking now. But as we were, um, as we were walking into the White House, uh, my mother grabbed me and looked at me and my dad, and she said, "Jesus Christ, this is a long way from York Street, uh, <laughs> and which is where you see, you know, this film takes place." So they didn't get to see this movie, but they did to go walk into the house of your president for a minute, and um, and we queued up and paid our respects to Mr. Lemon, and it was the Clintons in residence and wow. um, 
So I think they almost expired with pride that night. I think, uh, aside, aside from the issue of tax, I think, that, I think they, 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 probably, they probably would have done the same with this one. He might say, uh, thank you for casting Jamie Dornan uh, yeah. in my part. Yeah, exactly. I think particularly, I mean, my dad would have been uh, very pleased, although he would have, he would have given, uh, my dad was a master carpenter, so he would have given Jamie a few uh, tips about how to handle wood and everything. Um, but my mum, who loved dancing and loved fashion, she would have been totally smitten uh, with Katrina. And they would have got on like a house on fire. Absolutely. I know we're running out of time. I'm going to get you out of here on this one. This is a very quick one. Am I losing my mind or did I hear Colin Farrell's voice uh, uh, as the radio announcer? Uh, no, it is not Colin Farrell. It, uh, it, no, it, I agree that it, it is close, but no, there is no Farrellian Easter egg in this picture. All right. Just making sure. Um, and then this one goes, uh, uh, there's a very... Common refrain from the Irish, which is, uh, I hear this from my, my mom all the time, things were so much better back in the day. Uh, and and I watch your film Belfast and it kind of proves to me that's not necessarily the case. Like things things are kind of rough all the time. And so I'm wondering if there's just an issue from 1969, uh, whether that you addressed here now or, or just in general, that still surprises you at how relevant it is. Uh, well, I think it basically it's this polarizing issue. You know, it's this uh, it's this swiftness to a tribal position, you know, um, Billy Clanton says you're, you're either with us or you're against us. And, um, you know, slipping into that simplistic way of governing human behavior, it's, it, it didn't work then, it doesn't work now. And what it leads is to the kind of massive rush of accelerated violence that goes from naught to 60 in four seconds that was that riot that was in your capital on the 6th of January this year. Uh, where suddenly, whoosh, the blue touch paper is, is lit, tribes are formed, and, um, you know, reason is out the window. So I think we've always got to be working on that one, I think, to, uh, to try and understand how, how not to uh, waste energy like that when there are so many other places we could put it. Uh, Kenneth, we could not be more honored to get time with you. We know you're doing so much press for this movie, um, yeah. and you will be all the way up till Oscar evening. So thank you for stopping by Real Blend. We really appreciate your time. Well, we well, thanks very much, boys. And it's really a pleasure to talk to you guys. You know your stuff, your passion and your enthusiasm and interest and knowledge in what we do is, is both inspiring and very frightening. Uh, so <laughs> so it's, good, it's, great, it's great to talk to you, and, and um, no doubt we'll talk to you, and I hope so. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Have a good day. You're, you're most welcome. Ditto. We obviously want to thank Kenneth Branagh so much for coming on the show and Focus Features for giving us time uh, with him on behalf of Belfast. Truly, truly uh, an incredible film that everybody needs to go check out. And uh, and he's just such a smart guy. Like, I can't get over how, how uh, intelligent and warm and into the process of filmmaking he is and uh it felt it, like you know. we both not to pat ourselves on the back like we both surprised him with our questions but he had fantastic he didn't have to like search for like he knew the answer to every one of our questions even if he was still yeah. surprised by them mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I, and again too he's doing so much press and i still feel like he got into the questions and, and yeah. had a good time while he was because yeah. oh, yeah. toronto this premiered in toronto or i mean this has been going since early fall it's going to keep going for a while. Yeah. Did Belfast win the People's Choice at Toronto? The Audience Award? E I believe Either Belfast Award. did or Power the Dog did. I forget which one I think did. It was, I think it was Power the Dog because I saw people giving you shit, Sean, for... Not liking it. Not liking yeah. it. I, but which, <laughs> so people didn't Power realize... Power the Dog does not seem like an audience award. Well, that was funny. Very... That was the funny thing to just talk about social media. I saw Sean post about, like, he specifically said, like, the audience isn't going to like this. And people say, <laughs> yeah, oh, it won the, the audience, audience award <laughs> at this festival. But, like, they're not remembering that a festival audience is not the audience. Sure. The people that go to a festival. Sure. <laughs> like, it's a a festival very... audience is the audience for Power of the Dog. Though. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> very much it was so. A funny, it was a funny burn on you, though. Like, well, it won the audience award. <laughs> Why do I go on social media is the question <laughs> at hand. Honestly. I, I either don't know how to do it <laughs> or because I, I tend to use a lot of sarcasm on social media and nobody gets it. Doesn't It doesn't there work. Not a even a little bit. Yeah, not even a little bit. Just put, yeah, just tweet in italics. Or just don't tweet. Like, isn't that that's, the, isn't that the, that's the, what I do. the rule? That's what I do. Don't tweet. All right. I reply to Jake's tweets with snarky gifts. Here's what's opening. I don't uh, see him. I'd be blocked. In theaters uh, and blocked. on streaming services. Finch. Uh, on 
Paramount, so, God, will you please stop with Finch? Uh, on Paramount Plus and going wide, who has seen Clifford the Big Red Dog? I have not. I did do um, some interviews for it, but I was not able to uh, get the screener going. Did you get Clifford? I, 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 I did actually get Clifford. There is a room where you got Clifford, yes. I did. Inter- I, hey, you know what? Here's something I can say I never thought I could say. I introduced okay. John Cleese to my dog. Oh, true. And what did he say? He um, said that he he, he said I fart in your general in your direction. General direction. <laughs> and your mother smells of animal. Oh, no, he compared uh, dogs to Nazis. Interesting. Yeah, because he said dogs kind of follow orders based on whatever it is that you tell them to do, whether it's right or wrong. And cats are just kind of nonchalant. But at, I got to be honest. At no point during the press tour for Clifford did I expect John Cleese to compare my dog to a Nazi. <laughs> so I got to be open. Got to be ready to roll with the punches. Ready to roll with whatever. All right, uh, Netflix has a movie uh, by Rebecca Hall coming out called Passing. Um, yep. Jake, have you seen Passing yet? I did see Passing, yes. Uh, is it? Uh, I know it came to Savannah. It was at the film festival. Yeah. I just not didn't get a chance to catch up with it. I didn't get down there in time. Uh, yeah, you know, I got to be honest with you. I, it was really a, a very small, intimate film. Absolutely worth your time. Uh, filmed in black and white. A lot of movies filmed in black and white, uh, obviously, this year. Um, Rebecca Hall brought up something in our interview, which is that films are not in black and white. Films are in shades of gray, which is kind oh. of what life is, which I thought was a really interesting point. Um, okay. I, so I'm going to so very quickly tell you that the whole plot of passing is based on something that I was embarrassed that I was fairly ignorant about, um, was this idea, still very much a thing today, I did not know, but, but I guess particularly in the 1930s in which this film was set, it's based on a, on a novella that was written then, this idea of um, African-Americans passing as, uh, as, as white people. Mm. Um, and uh, one friend running into another after having not seen them for a while and realizing that she is not only attempting uh, to pass, as it is called, she is married to a very racist white man played oh. by Alexander Skarsgård. Um, it's it's a really it's an interesting look at at society and it's it's very much one of those and we use we use kind of this terminology a lot but it's 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 very interesting how it's done here this idea of set in 1930s you wouldn't have to change that much to set it in 2021 yikes which is sometimes horrifying uh, when you really try to examine how you know so often we we look at technology and love to pat ourselves on the back in terms of how much we've evolved and then you look at the human race and realize sometimes we have not. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I gotta be honest with you. When this movie was over, I thought to myself, I cannot wait to see the next thing Rebecca Hall does as a director. Oh, I mean, really? Got a, she, I think she's got a great eye. Kevin, I'd love to get your thoughts. She, you know, she films it in four by three, which I, I like, she does something that, that Kevin's really good about too, which is explaining not just, okay, it's, it's in a square, but in terms of how she uses it as a story, the idea is these people are boxed in mm. and I wanted to film it in such a way that made you feel like these characters are one in a world that is not black and white but shades of gray and also they're boxed in and that really kind of let this light bulb off go off in terms of everything that kevin's always talked about on the show and kevin you always talk about using imax and using four by three in a narrative fashion and i don't think i truly understood what you were talking about until she phrased it in that way and then i kind of retroactively thought back to everything you always talked about and thought well shit okay that makes sense it's not just a box. I will say, I still don't see it for Snyder Cut. I still don't see the benefit of doing it for Snyder Cut. But I do see the benefit of doing it for something like Passing. But Snyder actually explained why, it, like, like narratively, from Man of Steel to BVS to Justice League, he narratively worked that out where they were rising, and that was kind of the sure. idea of the... And, and uh, I, of, I, I, I think yeah. that would have made more sense if I could have seen it on an IMAX screen. I still lament I, I, not yeah. being able to see that I on, think, a, on an I IMAX. Think, yeah, it's hard for me to see them rising when really all I'm seeing them do is get thin. <laughs> see, and but like even with like something <laughs> like Spencer, because there, there's two variations of that boxed-in element. There's the 4x3, which is what Rebecca is doing in that film, and then there's the 166 to 1, which is what Pablo did in Spencer. Um, both of them are ex- extreme boxes, but... Jake, I feel like I feel like for you, you would probably prefer one six six to one because then the edges are skinnier in black. Four by three is like is like the the black bars are larger. So like Spencer is still boxed in, but it's sure. but it's one like six Spencer, six to one. In, in a sense, Spencer makes sense to me 
and passing makes sense to me. I think whenever it's these, you know, whenever it's these smaller intimate films and it is this idea of trapping these characters, then then that is something I can wrap my brain around. Lighthouse. I think because you're talking Lighthouse, like even Lighthouse. Um, mm. I think with something like, yeah, Lighthouse, they're very much trapped. I think uh, when we're talking, when we keep going back to Snyder Cut, when we're talking about superheroes that are supposed to be getting bigger before our eyes, but I watched it on my TV in my living room, I didn't, and I saw both BVS and Man of Steel on the biggest screen imaginable. I, it's just, I didn't have this feeling like I finally saw them getting bigger. I, I did not have, yeah. I did not experience that. I got, well, I get what he's saying, but it did not work for me. I, I, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for saying what you said because, like, sometimes, like, when the, with the aspect ratio stuff, it, it is in the weeds. But I, I feel like one of the things that I've loved about doing this show is that hearing from listeners who say they now watch films a little differently because they think about those things. But especially now with the filmmakers that we have, like Denis Villeneuve and Chloe uh, Zhao and and Nolan, um, that stuff is all narrative. It's all, like it's all narrative. And and when you yeah. when you see and Gabe, you saw Dune and IMAX, like those narrative jumps to the dreams are it, it, it punctuates it. It punctuates the emotion. So like. Aspect ratio is a very interesting thing, and I think I, I, I I'm glad that that Rebecca talked yeah. about it like that because that is exactly what you do in terms of intending that. Like, Doesn't it's not it, just be like I'm just be artsy. It's like it's literally a narrative choice. You Doesn't know? it also feel like in the past two years, let's say, that a lot more filmmakers are doing things like this? Like, you want to know? I, what, I I I think, and I could be wrong. I don't want to misquote this, but I believe I was interviewing Rebecca Hall for Godzilla, the new Godzilla movie. And I asked her about the four by three she shot in for passing. And I, th- I want to say it was her that said this, but it could, I uh, could be wrong. It Robin Wright Penn it. might have, maybe it was Robin Wright. Maybe, the, maybe Ray, Robin Wright Penn, the idea of the idea of, yeah, maybe it was, maybe it was Robin Wright Penn. The idea that most movies and, and television now is widescreen. Mm-hmm. So setting it apart from, to make it look cinematic. Now they're going back to that four by three or right. that, that ratio to make it look like a movie because TV now looks like movies essentially yeah. was, was kind of the idea. I think. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh, uh, one more note I did. I want to make about passing very quickly. If you are um, listening to the subject of this film and you are wondering why someone like Rebecca Hall feels like she has the right to tell this story. What is mm. interesting is that her mother is African-American. And so mm. she has felt for a long time, she has identified mm. with the idea of passing. Um, which I thought was a really mm. fascinating thing. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of you know it's a even though it's a a story written in the uh, early 20th century, it is something that she felt very um, close to even today in 2021. Cool. Mm. Um, I want to jump to Red Notice, which is coming to Netflix. And Ooh, I'm so to, curious to get your thoughts. The boys got to review it last week, and I caught up with it after the fact, and I am dumbfounded that this movie has uh, such a negative reaction on Rotten Tomatoes. I do not understand. People I actually, went in with their knives sharpened, I think. Uh, yeah, but I, I texted that's you a guys. Different, that's a different Netflix property. Knives Out? Yeah, they uh, spent $400 million on but two Knives Out sequels <laughs> or something like that. I texted the Real Blend text there the minute that that movie was over, and I said, that is the best version of that type of movie yes, that I, I have seen. It is not reinventing the wheel, it is 100% within the formula, um, but it is incredibly attractive people uh, who are also very charismatic and funny being incredibly attractive and really charismatic and really funny. And um, I heard, you know, some of the knocks against it are like, it's a globe trotting movie that they shot on green screens because of COVID. Like, I never once felt that it was, you know, uh, boxed in or, or cheap looking or, or anything. Uh, I I thought the sets were actually really impressive. I thought the action was shot really well, but I, I didn't go into that movie looking to judge, you know, the the filmmaking craft of it as much, much as I thought it was good. I thought the script was hysterical. Like yeah. I thought it was really really funny. I thought Ryan was funny. I thought Dwayne was funny. Gal ended up being one of the funniest elements I've ever seen her. I thought she improved a lot um, in terms of what she's able to do comedically. I guess I'm comparing it to Keeping Up with the Joneses, which is not the best movie in the world. Um, but the three of them together were terrific. And so to see that movie get eviscerated uh, for just being what it is um, kind of kind of melts my brain because it's it's really, really funny. Um, there's one scene in particular, and hopefully by now you've seen it, that completely takes it out of them out of it for me. And that's the bullfight scene. 
There's a funny conversation happening in the bullfight scene. Well, then you get the Jurassic Park moment. But yeah. the green screen in that is like, yeah. okay. what are we doing? <laughs> like, Rock's character gets hit by the bull, and it looks, it's not even like a cartoon. It's just, I, I don't know what's happening in it. But uh, but other than that, I thought that was, I thought that movie was a blast. And, uh, yeah. and definitely people should press play on it on Netflix. Um, Kev, I want to throw it to you for Belfast. So the three of us can start gushing about Kenneth Branagh's film. Uh, it's going to start rolling out to theaters and uh, tell us what you thought about the latest from Sir Kenneth Branagh. Yeah, I mean, this it's like there are a few films that come across sometimes that just hit you in a way that you haven't felt before. Um, and it's like and, and there's this beautiful magic to this film because at the same time, it's simultaneously heartbreaking, but also uplifting. Um, and I don't I'm, that is such a hard balance to find and to like to go into a film like that which is about something where a lot of people died um and but but to live in the world and feel the humanity of the people on the ground and leave feeling uplifted in certain ways because not only are we remembering the people but we're celebrating uh belfast and we're celebrating um humanity and, and aspects like that but it's but it's done in a dark time um and i find that so fascinating because to sit there as an in an audience and fall in love with a film that's dealing with such heavy subject matter it can only be told by a master storyteller where it balances it out, where you're viewing it through the eyes of a young boy. Um, the cinematography in this film, I, I, we were talking, you know, in the interview with Mr. Brana or Kenneth Brana that you heard, these lenses that they were using, like he was talking about shooting 185, which that, that's a really interesting aspect ratio, going back to the aspect ratio conversation. 185 is basically super tall, uh, 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 very tiny black bars on the top. So it's a very large image. Um, so to do that, but with anamorphic lenses is like, it, it's so interesting. Like there's the, the, the feeling, it's almost like you can like, you were, you were in the movie, you could dive into the screen and the movie celebrates movies. And one of the things that Brana does brilliantly is you're in black and white. But when the actors go to the when the characters go to the movies, the movies are in color. And that that whole like whole idea was that, you know, you would leave the real world and like go into this technicolor dream. And that's kind of the concept of that. Um, and performance wise, Dornan, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, is it Katrina? I yes, want to make Katrina. sure. Katrina. Yes. Mm -hmm. Un, I, it's just from Outlander. And I know my uh, Lauren, uh, my Lauren, my wife, Lauren's friend, Lauren thinks it's like the best show of all time. And it has been Katrina. I, by I know the way, a lot was, of people that love that show. I keep meaning to watch it. Yeah. Katrina was brilliant in Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah. Um, but yeah. That's a whole other performance. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so Van Morrison's music, the cinematography, the storytelling, um, I, I don't know how you make uplifting and heartbreaking mm. simultaneously work in 95 minutes. Not a single scene is wasted. Um, I know it's early, but I, I texted you guys the moment I got out of it. I feel I said, this feels like best picture and best director to me. It just, it does. And, yeah. and, 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 I, and I, I'm normally kind of against that idea of like, what's an Oscar film? But this movie is special i i would compare it to maybe seeing la la land for the first time not in mm. terms of like uh at all subject matter but mm -hmm. in terms of like the magic that the filmmaker so brought it's gonna to the it's screen. gonna win and then lose <laughs> yeah well oh i know but like but yeah it's interesting but but uh, mm. i you know again not comparing it to la la land in terms of thematics just more of like how you felt we just saw something yeah. special yeah yeah that yeah. was magical there was pure yeah magic built into this film it's, so, it's phenomenal five out of five incredible my last question to uh sir kenneth was also one that i asked to uh kieran hines when we got him during the junket time which was just it's a movie set in 1960s but it still feels like it could be really relevant today like what's what the theme from the movie that you think you know you're surprised that it's still so relevant and you heard sir kenneth talked about like how pol you know politically or socially we are we immediately divide into camps you're either for us or against us type thing um, and that's kind of the answer that I expected to get. And Kieran Hines said to me, he goes, I think it's really amazing that we still have this uh, idea that if I could just sit closer to the cute girl in class, 
uh, that I might, you know, it's going to brighten up my day and it's going to like, <laughs> that's, that's one of the guiding things because that is such an element of Belfast that I feel is getting overlooked. Everyone's talking yes. about the, the, the elements of Northern Ireland and the Catholics versus the Protestants and, and what is this family going to do? Are they going to be able to, uh, have to move away? Can they get a better life for themselves? But so much of this movie is centered around this young boy, Jude, who's the, you know, the lead character in it. And, and the crush that he has on, you know, this girl that his, in his class. That storyline is what yielded the biggest laugh. I got without giving it away when he finally gets what he wants and he realizes yes. it's not actually that is probably the hardest I laughed in the entire movie. Uh, well, there's also so a weird element too with the way that the kids are aligned in their desks um, yeah. and they keep moving their desks around and that made okay. Michelle yeah she was horrified because they put <laughs> they put the dumbest kids in the back of the class <laughs> yeah and she's like that's the opposite <laughs> you're supposed to like they were basically <laughs> telling the students yeah. Come up front because you're smarter. Because you're smart. I, yes. I, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> oh God, we should have talked to him about that. Oh, I there's know. so much we could have talked to him about. I know. Uh, I can't say enough good things about this little boy um, who is just a, a complete natural. Like, I have no clue how he is as good as he is. Um, you know, a lot of that's probably Brana, and a lot of it's his his cast members who happen to be here in Hines and Judy Dench and just amazing people like that. Um but I'm with Kevin. It's a five out of five. I mean, it's just it's it's truly one of the most amazing films yeah. that I've seen this year. And I can't point to anything where I would be like, yeah, but <laughs> there's just nothing. It's it was from start to finish. Perfect and flawless. And I loved it. Yeah. So. And it's 95 minutes. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. All movies should be 95 it's, minutes. Yeah. This is um this is that time He's, of year. He says with two Avengers posters yeah. behind yeah. <laughs> and, and a three hour Spider Man movie yeah. coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is uh this is that time of year where because uh, I know we love doing top ten lists and I love doing top ten lists, but this is where I start getting angry at myself because it's like, well, like Belfast is my number one of the year, but then Dune's also my number one of the year, but they're also mm. two completely different films, and how can I weigh Dune sure. against Belfast? Two different films with two different missions, two different purposes, two different experiences. Yep. Both succeeded in two completely different things. Yep. So this is where like my mind starts tearing itself apart. Here's what I love most about Belfast is that this is a movie, a man made, a semi autobiography about his own childhood growing up in Ireland. And the whole time I'm watching it, I felt like, yeah, a little little, little Roma esque. The whole time I the whole I, I thought to myself, oh, this is kind of like, obviously aside from. <laughs> You know, the Catholics pushing out the Protestants. But there are elements where I was like, oh, this is kind of like my childhood. Like, I remember my grandma used to take me to the movies. And I yeah, remember, yeah. Like, like, kind of standing on the stairwell and, like, listening to my parents talk about stuff that I wasn't supposed to be listening to. And I remember, you know, hoping, you know, thinking I would have a, a, a better shot with a, the pretty girl in class if, if somehow we got sat next to each other at class. You know, there's a man is making a movie about himself set in another country and, and decades ago. Yep. And it's so universally relatable where you think... Well, it's kind of about me growing up in Southeast Texas in the early '90s. Like yep. it's it's like that's astonishing to me, and that's like the power of Kenneth Branagh storytelling. That's the, the power of, of movies. That's the power of well-made movies. And it's just you're absolutely right. It's it's you guys um, kept using a word before I had the chance to see it, and uh, and, and the word was magic. And you're absolutely right. And and I'll wrap on this. I think I saw it in what was. There is a screening room here in Chicago called uh, the the Lake Street Screening Room, and and every once in a while, if they need like if they don't want to rent out a whole theater, you have to go to this building, and it's on the 16th floor. You take an elevator up, and it's probably 20 seats. Um, Roger Ebert famously had one seat. Siskel used to sit in another seat. You never sat in one of those. You know there was always, and usually when it's a screening, it's just you. Which sometimes they have private screenings for us, or maybe just only one or two of us need to see it. They'll do it there. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they'll rent out a whole big AMC. Um, I got to sit alone in the third row of a of a 20 seat screening room and just mm. be washed over and i cannot imagine a better scenario experience watching like on a saturday morning sipping on my coffee at 10 a.m mm. and it was beautiful it was an absolutely perfect it was just a perfect experience for a perfect film five out of five Easy. Jake, and Jake, how can the regular people uh, get pay for the fancy man experience? Is there a way for them to pay for the fa fanciest of fancy men? We crossed that already. You sneak in. <laughs> you sneak in. You take, do you take Roger's seat? <laughs> this I, oh, I, I, I take Roger's seat and then kick my feet up on Siskel's seat. <laughs> no, no, there, no, no, no. With all due respect to to the great Siskel and Eber, who sure. I have nothing but love and respect for. Oh, they, they, there are so many great stories where it's almost like um. Big Bang Theory and Sheldon, which I know you guys love when I talk about, that there's such a, like, whenever whenever they were with us, the great Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel, 
you know, you knew not to sit in their seats. Sure. And like when a newbie would come in and sit down like an Ebert, everyone would go, no, 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 no. Like, and they'd be like, what? They'd be like, that's, that's Ebert's seat. Get out. Move. Because <laughs> they all had very specific places. They like, and I, I just, I have, I have, oh, I love, I have a signed Roger. I'm a huge Roger Ebert. That's huge awesome. Roger Ebert fan. Very funny. All right. Well, we're all huge fans of Belfast and we yes. recommend that you go see it several times in the theater because it is fantastic which brings us to our blend game and in the blend game is loosely tied to the bonus episode that we dropped earlier this week it is our interview with absolutely insane Hans zimmer and you guys need to go find that listen to it watch it uh and we're playing Hans zimmer blend and i would be remiss to start with anybody but kevin mccarthy kev take it away what's your favorite (laughs) Hans zimmer score i feel like y'all know is it interstellar it's interstellar it has to be yeah it's (laughs) the best score he's ever written is it did he punctuate your pick as Interstellar when he said that his score is the reason it got made in the first place? <laughs> well, I mean, no, my, my, it was it, it was just already, has to be. It was already my favorite score of his, yeah. but um, it's interesting because like True Romance is one that I would have like tried to have gone to, but True sure. Romance, his score for True Romance is so much like um, this score in this movie in Terrence is it Terrence Malick's Badlands? Bad, yeah. Like Badlands? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, there's a, the music in Badlands sounds very similar to what Hans did with, um, True Romance. Um, but True Romance, that, that, I mean, that, that was part of my wedding. So that, that, that's just a personal thing. But in sure. terms of like Interstellar, so, yeah, Chris Nolan basically told Zimmer a theme or two of the film and said, this is what the movie's gonna be centering on but i'm not gonna give you any plot any story that's insane um, to me right and zimmer just kind of like he, and, and like a whatever nolan said to him like something like this is about a daughter uh losing her father and or whatever the themes were he gave to him what's her um, name murph <laughs> murph <laughs> um but so whatever zimmer came up with uh, in our interview, you'll see on the video, right? And he tells us that he showed Chris Nolan the score right there on that couch. And they said, all right, we got to make this movie now. <laughs> um, that score is, it, it's on a level that I, it, it makes me feel um, more human than I've ever felt before. If that makes sense. There's wow. a, there's a very, it's a very chilling, very heartbreaking, very, um just beautifully written piece of music um the mcconaughey scene as he's watching his kids grow up um as we've discussed before on the show and that score hitting um it's i i can't i can't it's 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 it's, it's, it's just like it's perfect filmmaking perfect composition of music to perfect performance to perfect direction um and one of the things I think Zimmer even noted in the interview that we pointed out to him is that these filmmakers like Nolan and Villeneuve and they're using scores as characters now. Like they're they're very, very heavy pounding scores like Dune and uh, Dunkirk and, um, uh, you know, Tenet. Uh, but this piece of music in its in its simplest form says everything about the film emotionally to me. So when I pop in the Blu-ray to pop, watch Interstellar and that theme is playing, I'm like emotionally going through the story arc as I hear it. Hmm. It's just it's it's so beautiful and it's so powerful and the instruments and the, and the it just everything he did with that score um, mixed in with the cinematography. It's just it's everything to me. That score is everything. That's why I have a tattoo for Interstellar. Um, and and Zimmer is a hard one to choose from because. He's written a lot of scores that I love, um, but that's what that's my ultimate. I love it. Um, I was going to I'm going to throw one out of left field, but then I'll go with my actual pick um, because I love a big I love a big theme song that the minute you hear the theme song, you know exactly what it is. And his pirate score is underrated. His mm-hmm. pirate score is tremendous. Like it's one of those where once you hear it, you know exactly what it is. You should feel like you're standing on a boat. You feel like you're racing through the water and you can picture it immediately. But I have to go with his Man of Steel score, which is not one that I loved at the beginning. Um, and it took me a long time to figure out what it was because I think I've said on the show before that I think the John Williams' the Superman score is one of the most perfect scores of all time. That is a theme that the minute you hear it, you know exactly what it is. You are 100% on board with what it is. And Zimmer, this is going to be weird to say, but he went in a um, complete opposite direction and went subtle. The element of this Man of Steel score that I'm talking about is the piano. 
Yeah. And the part of the reason why, because eventually it gets to a, a thunderous, you know, drums and, and yeah. traditional Zimmer. But when when I finally got a chance to see Snyder Cut earlier this year and the Superman theme comes in, Zimmer Superman theme of the piano keys comes in, um, that was the most emotional I felt in that movie. Uh, I was like on board and I couldn't believe that it was happening and it was, uh, you know, bombastic and, and amazing. And then when uh, when that score hit and it meant Superman was coming back and I was like, dear God, that's amazing. And part of the reason why I, I now have an even deeper appreciation was that I was listening to him talk about how he wanted to root, you know, that score in the human element of Clark Kent. And how can Clark, who is an alien, feel more uh, in tune with the people of our planet? And so he and, and I love Zimmer talking about like how he was frozen with fear of how do I follow up John Williams and Zack Snyder coming in and just saying like, dude, it's a movie, you know, <laughs> stop. What are you doing? You're getting in your own head. And that's such a brilliant Snyder thing to do. And it's such a great Zimmer story. And that score is fantastic. That score is, is unbelievable. So um, I, I had to go had to go Man of Steel in this case. So Jakey, and, and to Sean's point, by the way, just real fast, the Zimmer interview like go find it um on our bonus because what sean's referring to that exact piece of that piano piece uh is explained in very good detail mm -hmm. and that's what gabe was talking about earlier and how it, it unlocked that score even more it's mm, it's, yeah. a, it's a really cool it was a great question from sean that he asked in the interview about williams to zimmer to su and to, to, to score superman but like that moment of zimmer telling us that open like unlocked so many different doors in terms of that score so it's yeah. like that question was amazing it was thank you was a good question. <laughs> jakey where'd so you go that. uh i went with gladiator oh interesting um, uh you know th cool. there, th i i have whenever it's a great movie score i tend to have two sort of very visceral physical reactions and and one of them is kind of the the pump up you know like i literally run i've gone on runs to the man of steel score like it's, mm -hmm. it's a very you know if i'm if i'm shuffling songs on my phone walking to work and the pirate score comes on he has a great tiny score called down is up from pirates 3 that is just brilliant mm -hmm. um and I'll, maybe i'll maybe i walk a half beat faster i mean you know maybe i you know but there's something that the gladiator score does particularly that score at the very end that very the swelling very you know after maximus has been killed and and Jarman Hansu is, is kind of, you know, talking to himself and scooping up the dirt, uh, burying the toy. And uh, that has the opposite reaction for me. That makes me almost stop in my steps and just like close my eyes where I feel like the swelling in my chest. Mm. And think about what we're talking about. We're talking about a man who takes a, a random combination of notes and puts them on a page mm. that instructs a group of people to put either air into an instrument or, 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 or pluck a string in a particular way. And that causes me to stop in my life and close my eyes. Like think right. about like the, the wild connection between those two. Yep. And I don't think any other, there, there are very few scores that, that cause me to do that. Um, you know, maybe Williams Jurassic Park score, maybe Sylvester's back to the future score where like, mm -hmm. I just kind of pause and just, it, take it in because like I don't, I want to just enjoy that moment and shut out the rest of the world. Um, that that final that final moment of of Maximus seeing his family and his son running over to him and Jamon saying like I'll see you again but but not yet as the camera pans up and we see the Colosseum and we see Rome. It's just it's it's beautiful and it's it's you know it's it's sweeping and it's it's just it's absolutely it's my it's my all time favorite of his. It is terrific. Audience picks. Uh, Raven Anderson said Sherlock Holmes, which is another, That's another great one. Terrific great score. score by Zimmer. Yeah. Uh, Sydney Sharing went with Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Ali Mohamida, oh, Ohamadi, sorry, Ali, uh, said it's nearly impossible, but went with the Thin Red Line. When, uh, Windy Coach said Dark Knight. Chris Tran, Bricks and Stuff went with Man of Steel. Harry Lichtman said Interstellar. Rachel Ho went with Larry K uh, <laughs> Larry Crown. Yes! <laughs> Lion I King. I love his Larry Crown score. I saw Lion King and I read it as Larry Crown. <laughs> What's the matter with me? Uh, Rachel it's Ho said Lion King and Christian Williams and Cam McKinney uh, both said Inception. So obviously there was a ton of love across the site for his unbelievable filmography. We want to thank everybody for sending in their picks. 
please go if you haven't yet uh go find our interview with Han, Hans Zimmer Hans Zimmer I, I, I gotta get used to calling him Hans uh, I know it's weird it's really it's really it's, weird calling him Hans like, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking that people are gonna listen to the interview and go they're calling him the wrong name right right <laughs> like, right I, but I I don't know if it's on camera or if it's in the edit but uh because uh, Gabe has so. the footage but but there's a yeah. moment where he says call me hands or hans so just keep that in there if we can just so just to give clarification to the audience all right next week uh because we have two amazing filmmakers on the show talking ghostbusters we're going to be playing hashtag ivan reitman blend but let us know your pick via email at realblend at simmerblend.com evolution if you want if you want it Uh, you're not kidding i love evolution i love evolution I actually liked Evolution. You don't mean year one. Year one is the one. No, it's not. Wait, I thought year one was Ramus. Oh, it might be. I think you're right. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my bad. He might have have produced it. My bad, my bad. Um, All right. Same same world. And listen for Jason and Ivan Reitman as our guests on next week's show, where we're going to be talking about Ghostbusters afterlife so uh, our next premium episode is a 2009 Oscars in review. So if you want to get... The premium access, head to the description. It'll tell you exactly how to sign up for that. In the meantime, follow us on social media at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach, and the show is at Real Blend. Uh, we'll be back next week, and we'll talk to you guys then when it all happens. Give us feedback on the episodes and send us reviews. I miss reading reviews. And, uh, hmm, 1941. Uh, Raiders. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> all, all, Spielberg, always, a Spielberg always, movie. Always, always, yes. always, always. <laughs>